Keith, we're living through turbulent times and certainly that's the case in the commercial property sector. For tenants, but also for landlords, what does a landlord do if they have a tenant currently that isn't paying any rent? It's a very difficult time, as you say. Um, the traditional methods of enforcement available to landlords, the most draconian of which is forfeiting a lease, is no longer there temporarily due to government restrictions. Those restrictions start, uh, began on the 31st of March last year, have been extended on four subsequent occasions, now ending on the 30, 31st of March this year, which means, as I say, a landlord can't threaten, we can threaten, but he can't actually action forfeiture, which is the ultimate method of enforcement available to a landlord. In addition, the landlord can't serve statutory demands, it can't exercise what we call CRA, where you get bailiffs to re-enter premises to take goods to the value of the rent, and it can't issue a winding up petition. So in answer to your question, what can a landlord do? In terms of enforcement, it can still pursue a claim for the rent. It can issue proceedings in the courts and get a judgment. Whether that judgment can be enforced and how long it will take to be enforced in the current climate, where there are massive delays with the courts, remains to be seen. Another option may be pursuing the guarantor of the tenant. And again, you can do that by issuing court proceedings, getting a judgment against the guarantor. And that's another method of, of means of enforcing a monetary claim. An alternative may be to draw down on a rent deposit, which landlords may or may not want to do. There may be good reasons not to do that, but ultimately there is a, a means by which to collect money if the landlord needs to do so. But none of these options are perfect. There is a voluntary code of conduct currently in place where the parties are encouraged to negotiate where the tenants may have to, well, where the landlords are actively encouraged to assist their tenants with things such as rent waivers or rent deferrals and or any other means by which to assist the tenant. The onus is on the tenant in response to queries raised reasonably by the landlord to provide information about their financial position. But ultimately, the market prevails. In the current climate, many landlords and many tenants are having to negotiate because landlords don't want empty properties and tenants are in need of assistance. The but is that at the end of this current moratorium, when the government restrictions come down, what's gonna happen then? Because I think there's gonna be a huge, well, there is a huge buildup of debt, which is gonna create massive pressures on tenants and even when they are obliged to pay rent how are they going to do it where there's been that build up of rent over what can be up to a year or more so difficult times dilapidations often referred to as the sting in the tail there are huge issues around this area currently can you just expand on a few of them for us sure the problem with dilapidations for many commercial tenants is that they don't really appreciate, or if they do, they may ignore the accruing liability that starts from day one of a lease. So what I mean by that is that when you move into a property, generally speaking, there is an obligation in the lease to put and or keep those premises, we call in good and substantial repair. The definition of repair is something that really only a surveyor can advise on down the line, which I'll come to. But when I call it an accruing liability, what a prudent tenant would normally make provision for repairs to be carried out during the currency of the lease term. But what often happens, of course, is that it may do 
carry out some works when it goes into initial occupation. But as the lease draws on, particularly with longer leases, when you get towards the end of the term, the use and occupation of the property means there's inevitable wear, tear and disrepair, particularly when it comes to things such as carpets, um, mechanical engineering, lifts, air conditioning units, etc. And those can give rise to massive liabilities at the end of the term. So you're absolutely right to say the sting in the tail, it's a, it's a phrase I often use. In terms of what a tenant should do or what a landlord should do at the end of the term, the, the, the advice I give to both is very similar actually. Plan early. When I advise a landlord or a tenant, but in particular a landlord, my advice will be to plan early and to instruct a surveyor to inspect the property for which they'll need access, which will be arranged with the tenant in order to prepare an interim schedule of dilapidations. The reason for doing that is, 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 is uh, several reasons for doing that actually. One, to serve the schedule on the tenant well in advance of the end of the lease. It puts the tenant on notice of the liabilities that he has to meet, it has to meet at the end of the term. It also means and provides the tenant with an opportunity to offer a financial sum instead of carrying out those works, which often happens. And that can be to the advantage of a landlord, particularly if it wants to do something else with the building and or improve the building, which is a repair or an improvement. You can't claim for improvements, only for repairs. So that can work to the advantage of the landlord and the tenant. The other, it also means that you are laying down a marker so that when the lease ends, if the tenant hasn't done the works, you then will convert that interim schedule after a further inspection by the surveyor into a terminal schedule, which is the prelude to claiming damages against the tenant for the costs of the repairs that need to be carried out. We then get into a protocol period and there are various defenses that a, a land a tenant can raise but that would be the approach i would strongly urge a landlord to take in relation to dilapidations which as you rightly say it's a sting in the tail to the tenant but in the current climate where landlords aren't receiving rents with increasing numbers of tenants serving break notices this is going to be a huge area of litigation i believe in the next few months and certainly next couple of years. Keith, uh, we have a little light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine programme um, accelerating. Is that light at the end of the tunnel, do you think, shared by landlords? What, what does the next six to 12 months look like for them? Oh, that's a very, very tough question. And if I knew the answer to that, I think I'd be a very wealthy man. It's really, really difficult to predict what's going to happen. I've heard it said that the current pandemic has escalated trends that were taking place prior to it by some five to 10 years. It really has moved the market in a direction um, and it's moving at pace. What do I see when I look into my crystal ball? Um, I think we're certainly going to see much shorter leases, that's for sure. When I started practice, leases were traditionally 20, 25 years. Then they moved to something under five years, and I suspect it's going to get a far, far, they're going to get far shorter going forward. There's been a lot of talk of um, turnover rents where landlords have to accept a rent based on the turnover of its tenant, which may or may work for some businesses. Obviously, retail is the obvious one. Hospitality to a lesser extent with restaurants. The problem that creates, of course, is how do you calculate turnover rent? How do you, what if you're selling a lot online? How does that work? The turnover rents can be advantageous to a tenant in bad times, obviously, 
it can be hugely advantage, advantageous to a landlord in good times where markets are good and tenants are making lots of money. They're taking a share in the business. Um, the high street, where's that going to go? Before lockdown, I used to often bleat on about the demise of the high street. With increasing numbers of people working from home at the moment, with the possible trend of people continuing to work to some degree at home, so you've got mixed working from home and from the office, will that regenerate the high street at the expense of the cities, all the city, city retail, city, the shops, etc. Offices, I don't know. Will offices get smaller? Will they sublet, will increasing numbers of offices sublet their space? Because we're going to have one here's flexible working. So these are trends that one sees, how they're going to materialize over the coming weeks, months, and years is, is as I say, difficult to predict. Thank you.